Um, my name is Tari Johnson Mack. I'll be interviewing. Oh, let me stop that because I don't even know. My name is Tari Johnson Mack. I'll be interviewing Dewan Lee today. Could you see, please say your name for the record? Dewan Lee. Um, any branch of service that you attended? Uh, Army Reserve. And where did you serve? Uh, reserves. I served in Saginaw, Michigan, Flint, Michigan, uh, and active duty Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay, sir. Were you drafted or were you? Did you enlist? I enlisted. Okay. Where were you living at the time? Uh, Flint, Michigan. Okay. Why did you enlist? Um, <laughs> believe it or not, my father wanted me to enlist out of high school uh, because he couldn't join when he was younger because of flat feet. Um, but I had a baseball scholarship, so I took the scholarship. And um, after my junior year, going into my senior year of college, I decided to go ahead and do it on the split plan and surprise him with that. Right. Much to the dismay of my mother, obviously. <laughs> Why did you pick that branch of service? Um, for the uh, for the adventurous uh, fact of army, um, I wanted a challenge. If I was going to do something, I wanted a challenge. And my dad, he also had always suggested me joining the army. So I said, "Okay, why not?" And it was a little easy. It was easier than the other branches to do the split as far as because I was still in college and I was still playing baseball so that gave me the split time to do part of the basic training part over that summer and then finish the uh, the advanced training uh, the following summer after I graduated from college so if you served in any wars which war did you serve in? I was in Desert Storm okay where exactly did you go? Uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, my unit, um, 5089th Reception Battalion, um, is a drill sergeant unit. So uh, we do, um, we are the people that meet all the new recruits when they first join the military. So we're the ones that first yell at them and uh, yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah, name, uh, dog tags, clothing, all that stuff. Get them conformed to uh, military life, basically. When you arrived there, how did you feel? What was the atmosphere like? Um, for active duty? Yes, active duty. Um, well, I went down with the um, advanced group, um, my unit. Um, went down early before the rest of our unit came so to set up uh, everything. So we were dealing with a lot of active duty um, personnel that were heading over to Iraq. Um, it was a little tense. Low tents. Were there any casualties? N uh, no, not not during the training because it, um, what we did while we were there, we did the training for the soldiers that had just recently got out within 18 months um, of getting out of military service, being called back okay. for active duty. We basically retrained all of them, got them all back in the swing of things and you know, with the physical training and because you get out and you let yourself go a little bit. So got them all back acclimated, got them basically re-enlisted. Um, it was a lot easier for them because they had already been through a routine and most of them had been in service for a minimum four years anyway. So it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, as opposed to when we usually go down for um, our two weeks in the summer or what have you, we have new fresh kids right off the bus right out of high school or jail, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, so this was actually a lot easier except for the fact that these guys, they had already been served their time and having getting called back, they weren't happy. So, Did you tell me a couple of your most memorable memories while being Desert Storm? Um, actually, yeah, I have one. Um, a friend of mine from that I've known since junior high school, and we went to separate high schools, but we played against each other in high school. Um, and we actually played in college. We played college baseball together as well. We were roommates. Um, he always thought it was crazy for me joining the Army the way I did and everything. But he wanted to be um, an FBI agent. So he was going to college for criminal justice. And after college, and so this is several years after college when Desert Storm hit, um, 
he had signed up, um, unbeknownst to me, because we had since separated and gone our separate ways and living in different towns and everything. And he got off the bus, one of my uh, during one of my uh, tours, and he was fresh. He enlisted to go to Desert Storm. And that was one of the few buses that new recruits had come in because, again, like I said, everyone else was coming back that already served prior. So this is one of the few fresh buses, as we used to call them, uh, that came in, and he was on it. So that was that was pretty cool. And so basically, I got a chance to yell at him and get him acclimated, you know, with the push-ups and all that stuff, and, and you know, <laughs> he has drill sergeant and all that good stuff, and, uh, but I did, actually, and another good thing, we're about the same size, wore the same size shoes and everything, so I actually snuck him and gave him a pair of uh, worn and broken in boots, because that's one thing, your feet do take a toll the first few weeks until you get acclimated with those hard boots, so. He was very appreciative of that. Okay. Yeah. Could you tell me a little bit more about the roles of a drill sergeant? Um, uh, yeah, we basically have, the thing about it in the military, you have to train, you have to train your men or your women to work as a group. And come before, they even get there. We already have their scores from their tests and their profiles and things of that nature. So we already know a, a little bit about them and who's a problem child, who's a little bit slow, who's, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, but you still have to have them work together as a, as a group, as a well oil machine. So basically our job is to break them down and then build them up, get them ready for any number of situations that may occur. And um, it's kind of hard. Um, that particular duty is tough. You do have to have the right, right mindset for it because you pull your hair out. Say, you know, these kids, when are they, when are they gonna get it? When are they gonna get it? And um, when you're going through basic training yourself, you're in that boat, so now at least as a DI, you can look back and reflect and say, okay, I remember that situation, let me see how I handle it, or how many tours you do, you figure it out and you uh, can conform to, or try to make that person conform and get their act together. It's, it's tough, because you have a lot of different personalities, um, a lot of different facets. You don't know the mindset of these people when they come in. You just know what they've written on paper and their profiles and so on and so forth. So it's a little taxing as far as that goes. Okay. Could you explain the steps to me of how it goes from enlistment all the way to being a reserve? How does it go? Well, I, um, here, um, reserve, is, reserve, is, is, yeah, reserve is a separate branch. You have um, active... Um, you have active duty, you have National Guard, you have reserve in, in the Army. And also you have enlisted and um, officer. Okay. Enlisted is um, the, <laughs> we call ourselves the grunts because we are the ones that do a lot of the physical things like that. The officers are the ones that command us and tell us to do this. And then obviously you have a hierarchy in both the enlisted detail and also the officer detail um, and you can work you work your way up up the, the scale as far as that go rank and all that stuff um, back when <laughs> and this is kind of mean I guess in a sense um, back when I was in we used to frown upon the officers because you know they had the book smarts but they really didn't have the know-how to get things accomplished so we thought, um, and that's one of the reasons I went enlisted because a lot of my friends had, that had been in said go enlisted, even though I could have gone in as an officer being you know, college, you know, just about to graduate college and all that stuff. And I actually put in my uh, um, OCS packet, Officer's Candidate School packet, and got accepted to be an officer. But, and they pay better, officers get paid better, but I just really, wasn't feeling it. I wanted to be enlisted, and so that's what I did. Although 
I still could have gone at any time. You know, when I was a sergeant, I still could have gone and got in and you know been a first lieutenant or what have have you, and then still already had the you know the airborne school and you know the drill sergeant training and all that stuff. Um, but I just I enjoy the enlisted being with the common folk, basically. So that's uh, that's that's the biggest difference as far as that goes. Um, active duty, you're active basically 24/7. Reserves, um, which I was, you meet once a month for a weekend, and then two weeks out of the year you go, and we went to Fort Benning. Um, um, other times, my unit was a special unit because we would go not just to Fort Benning to do our, do our training, but we would have specialized training up uh, northern Michigan or in Wisconsin, so it wasn't that the fact that we just met just at that those prescribed times like normal Reserve or National Guard units do. And National Guard is pretty much similar. It's just different name basically, but pretty much similar uh, way that things are run. Um, but my unit was fortunately a <laughs> more specialized unit, so we would actually go train in different places more often than the typical uh, reserve units would. Okay. Um, so after basic training, which would be the next step? Um, AIT. Advanced Individual Training. So that would be basically your uh, MOS. Um, that would be your job. What, what is your job in the military? Um, and I have five, five MOSs. Um, <clears throat> administrative Specialist, um, again, from because I was in college and everything, I took that. Um, that's basically business and uh, running the office and things like that. Um, um, I have uh, computer uh, specialty, two computer specialties, um, and um, um, airborne um, 11B, which is <clears throat> infantry. So that's basically, if you don't pick anything, that's what you get. So basically, you are a grunt. You are the field, out in the field, humping, you know, what you basically you see on TV now. A lot, a lot of that. They don't show you, you know, the medics and all that stuff. They show you all the people, you know, hiding behind the walls and stuff. That's 11 Bravo. Um, and then uh, airborne and uh, blah, 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 blah. what else? I forget. There's another one. I forget. I forget what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's been a while. Right. It's been a while. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Um, yeah. Um, I was uh, soldier of the cycle. Um, I had the distinguished unit, my, uh, my battalion and, uh, my, my squad, um, which is good if you're training people, that's a good word to have. Um, let's see, um, hmm. just, you know, uh, service, good conduct, uh, Things, things of that nature, which you just have to do your job, and you get recognized for doing a good job. Okay. So, how did you stay in touch with family? Did you go visit them at all? Uh, active duty, uh, no. Um, but during wartime and everything, um, we were there 18 months. Um, so no, but just that's just then that was phone and letters and things like that. And that's another thing um, that when you're in there, it is highly recommended drilled into your head actually basically they put a pen and a piece of paper in front of you and say you will write a letter to your family on a regular basis whether you like them or not you will write a letter just to let them know that you're doing okay that is something that i think is very admirable about any branch of service that you keep in contact with your family and that's what the leadership cadre they make you do that you stay in contact with um, your family um when i was in reserve i was near family because basically your reserve unit is typically within 50 miles of your residence so reserve or national guard so you're pretty close to some some form of family okay because you typically have a, a normal job during that time period too so. <laughs> yeah describe the national guard to me is it very similar to the, to the reserve? reserve yes very similar yeah very similar. yeah they um national guard 
they're on actually they're on more call. National Guard is city, I mean uh, state based. So you, um, if you have a natural disaster, flood, or something like that, National Guard is first to respond, and then if they need backup, then they bring the reserves. Um, um, Army wise, active duty wise, I think reserves go before National Guard because National Guard still covers the home base, you know, the, their state in case of something else, but they will get pulled also if, if needed. I think that's, uh, that's pretty much the only difference. While in active duty on base, did you get plenty of supplies? Oh, yeah. Or did you have to purchase your own? Um, well, active duty, um, you, well, you get paid. Right. So it's not like you're uh, working for free. Food and things like that, that's, that's free. You're active, you go to the mess hall, you eat. Um, but um, if you have a vehicle, obviously you pay for your own fuel. Um, your clothing, you're in battle dress uniform, so, or <laughs> depending on the situation, so you really clothing wise and things like that, unless you uh, are, have, um, you know, a leave or something like that, then you wear your own regular clothes, otherwise you don't have to pay for clothing. Um, what was the food like? Sneakers. Food is good. Food is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. They have uh, multiple choices, so you don't. Uh, there's always something for you to eat, and yeah, you can. They feed you what you. And when you're going through basic training, they feed you what you need. They don't let you. You know, the the heavy guys they slim down. They say so. You're eating this, this, and this, and you. will If you have more than on your plate, then you should. You will be checked on that aspect. Um, the thinner ones to bulk them up, you eat more. So, again, try to get everyone. Sure. Yeah. Did you feel pressured or stressed while in active duty? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Because we were actually training, um, again, we were uh, sending over the people that had just come out, and um, we were actually waiting to be deployed ourselves. And we were actually re. Institute retraining the guys um, that were um, we were gonna head over with um, when the ceasefire came. So we were we were gonna leave within a few days of the ceasefire ourselves. So yeah, it's stressful, especially when you know you talk to your family. Oh, how's everything? Well, yeah, we're getting ready to go, and you know then you hear the tears of the phone and blah 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 and so yeah. It's said yeah, it's it's stressful, and then other people uh, you. You're not the only one in the boat, so to speak. So other people take things, people take things in different ways. Some people are more emotional about things than others. And you know, when you start getting all these emotions, especially with your friends coming through, uh, people that you train with and you work with and everything, because it, again, it's a job. And yeah, it can be stressful. <clears throat> Was there anything you did special or any quote that you said for good luck before you were going in to do something? Nah. Mm -mm, nothing like that, you know, just, uh, <laughs> just live in a moment and uh, think about, I, I used to tell all, all of my kids, even though at that time, some of, some of these guys that I was training were old, as old as I was, because um, this was in my early 20s, um, just tell them to, you know, just keep your head up and don't let things get to you. Because in real life, you have to realize it's a job. Do your job to the best of your ability. And you're that, by you doing your job, you're protecting this person. And by that person doing their job, they're protecting you. And that's what it's about. How did people entertain themselves when not on, on duty or on leave or in their free time? <laughs> Bowling. Um, Basketball, shooting hoops, tennis, they, most bases have any activity you really want to do. Golf, I've got a chance to play golf a few times on courses that you know, some people don't get on. And it's just any, anything, any, any movies, and church, and, and anything. And this is all on base or uh -huh. you have to go? Oh, yeah, most, pretty much everything. Yeah, pretty much everything. These posts are big. So pretty much everything. Did you give me an average size that you think it would be? Like uh, People-wise? Oh, square miles. Oh, my gosh, no. Um, 
shit. Some of these places are bigger than your typical city. Oh. And then all the training and everything. When you have tanks out here doing maneuvers and, you know, you have how many dozen firing ranges and things like that, you're talking a couple hundred square miles. Oh. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of acreage. Yeah. Pretty much all of them. Some, again, some are larger than others. And population-wise. Population-wise, yeah. 20,000. Uh, it's good size. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have to be, they have to be big. Just think, you know, how many people are over in Iraq and Afghanistan right now? They're quite, quite a few. And they're from all over the place. You know, when you have a couple hundred thousand troops, and when they're here, they're sitting at some base. You got twenty some thousand here, thirty some thousand there, fifty thousand here. A lot of, and there's still a lot of people that are here still manning the, the regular bases that aren't even over there because they rotate them. So you have a lot of, yeah. a lot What of did that. you do on your leave time? Um, I was a terrible bowler, but um, got on a bowling league with some other buddies, things like that. Um, just, um, Johnson Mac, I'll be interviewing Dewan Lee today. Could you see, please say your name for the record? Yeah, uh, bowling. Um, we used to play basketball a lot. Me and uh, some of my buddies. Um, I um, actually, I was the manager and captain of our softball league also. We had a softball league and we played different uh, battalions and uh, that. So we'd get up early. Sometimes we'd miss uh, PT because we'd have our own practices in, in the morning. And uh, So that, that was good. That was a good stress reliever because, again, I, I played baseball in college. So I got down there, had my glove with me and everything. There were so many other guys that had brought their stuff, their footballs, golf clubs, things like that. So just uh, things pass the time away. Okay. Were there a limited amount of things that you can bring with you? Like it, when you're enlisting, would it say only bring your clothes or only bring special items? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, when you're going through basic training, you bring basically your toiletry set, um, a couple days worth of clothing, a good pair of sneakers, at least one good pair of sneakers. And that's that's about it, because everything else is issued to you. Towels, underwear, t-shirts, pants, socks, uh, boots, yes, but your sneakers, if you don't have good sneakers, you have to go buy sneakers on, on post. So uh, tooth, toothbrush, toothpaste, things like that, you have brain, if not, you have to go buy one you know, once you get there because they give you when you get up they don't they see they do an inventory of what you have they put everything out say okay this is going in your locker this is going to storage you can keep this radios things like that forget about it a book or two fine but not basically it's essentials because it's not a whole you're, you're gonna be working you're gonna be training so and your free time is no there ain't that much of it so just just the basic stuff, and they yes. they give you a list. They give you a list of everything that you need. And so, and I'm guessing your free time you spend sleeping or relaxing as much as you can. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Where did you travel while you were in service? Um, actually, I just stayed in state. Yeah. Um, drill sergeant units typically don't get a chance to get out and and see a whole lot of different places. So, um, I was. Um, I did my basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, then I was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina uh, for my um, AIT, Advanced Individual Training. Uh, then Fort Benning, obviously, um, for a lot of um, the training and uh, a lot of work, active duty stuff. Um, Fort Gordon, Georgia, for some other training. Um, ooh, Fort Gordon, Fort Lewis. Um, Uh, Fort Leavenworth for uh, a little training, just, um, but every, all my stuff was in state, in, in the states. Um, Camp Grayling, um, that's up in the, uh, up north in Michigan. Just 
here, there, <laughs> everywhere, but mostly, for the most part, um, east, uh, east of the Mississippi, all, all of my training. Did you keep a personal diary or a notebook to jot down memories of thoughts? Nah. No. Mm -hmm. I've never been that kind of person. <laughs> I just keep it all up here, and when it comes back, it comes back. <laughs> Do you remember the date that your service ended? Um, I kind of think, um, well, my reserves actually ended, uh, uh, I think, August of 94, either 94 or 95. Um, I left Michigan, moved down here to Florida. Um, and was um, about to get a uh, staff sergeant. And um, actually, I, I think I'd just gotten it, staff sergeant. Um, but I left the same month and moved down here. They were trying to find me a unit down here, um, but there were no, no slots available for me because they had just two places where I was trying to get into. They had just promoted from within the positions that I would have, and there were people who had been there longer, so me being a reserve. If that's the case, they, you just sit, and if they need you, they can call you and say, we need you to report you know, for duty or whatever. And, but you call them and say, no, we don't have anything for you yet, you know, put you on a holding pattern. So my last year was basically a, just a holding, holding pattern, and then I got my honorable discharge papers. Okay, your time is up, your time served, you're done. So that kind of stunk. Even though I was still running and you know working out and all that stuff, but when I got those papers, I was like, okay, that's it. Could you explain any benefits that there are in being in service? Um, well, um, yeah, well, because I took some college classes after I had um, graduated, and they paid, they reimbursed uh, some of the tuition as far as that goes, books and things like that, um, which was good. Um, and also, um, while I was uh, in my senior year, also, so extra uh, books and things like that that I needed, that, that got reimbursed, which is which is good. Um, had uh, while you're in the military, you have medical, dental, all that stuff, vision, all that. They take care of all that. So you just send an appointment and you go have whatever you need done done. So that's that's huge. Once you get out. Um, you can keep your insurance if you want, but a lot of times people just let it go and so then you don't have it. But um, I have friends that um, have to go to VA and things like that. As long as you're a veteran, you can still go and it's a reduced cost or, or free in certain cases. So fortunately for me, I haven't had any health issues, so I haven't had to use it, but you know, possible. Okay. It's all, and um, then, um, on the um, you have um, purchasing power as far as purchasing a, a home, things like that. You have to do all the paperwork for all that stuff. Um, I haven't had the occasion to use that either. And just some. I'm a little different than some people. I think if you can make it on your own without assistance, do it. Even though, yeah, I have the ability to do that, but I wouldn't purchase my own stuff. And so. Let some let someone else you know the government did enough for me. Let someone else that is less you know it's fortunate for me that can benefit from it. Let them do it. So. Could you explain to me what the GI Bill is? Uh, GI Bill is um, if you're enlisted or um, I don't I, I honestly I don't know if it works for officers because officers typically have to be college graduates before you can even be considered an officer officer before you can go to the training or whatever. Um, I think it's mostly for enlisted. Um, you do your service, and then the, they pay for college, your tuition, things, books, and things like that. Again, like I said, they help. The, when I took extra classes after I graduated, um, they reimbursed me for that. That's part of the GI Bill. What do you do in the days, on on the weekends afterward? This is after service. What did you do? Were you still in the mode of getting up early at six o'clock or five o'clock? When you're active duty? When you're out. This is after service. Oh, I, oh, after you, oh, after you're out and everything. Yeah, yeah like I said, um, um, when I finally got the paper saying that I was done after being 
sitting, you know, basically on the bench on, on hold, not even be able to be an active reservist. I was in, in the active reservist. Um, I was still running, staying in shape because, you know, you get used to that stuff and you just do. And uh, I was eating right and everything else, um, living my life basically, but uh, still in military mode, so to speak. It just, it fades. Some, some people it fades faster, some people, it, you know, takes longer. Ah, uh, shoot. I think I was running, still running, two years after, after I was done. So I'd say up until probably 98, 99, I was still running, being, you know, in, in that mode, not just, you know, running for fun, which I think running for fun is boring. <laughs> but now I, I see people running, I was like, man, I used to do that. I used to run like that. I used to, and I just don't do it anymore. Push-ups, things like sit-ups, all that stuff. I used to just constantly just do all that stuff. Bored, watching TV. Start doing push-ups, sit-ups, things like that. Just because that's what we did. You know, back then we sat, when I was active and even in reserves, um, we have competitions who could do the most push-ups, who and in the reserves, you talk to your buddies and say, are you coming this, you know, come this weekend for, you know, um, for training and for drill? I say, yeah, well, uh, hope you, you know, hope you're ready to do them push-ups and everything else. And, oh, yeah, so, you know, stay in shape, be, you know, competition. But active duty, that was a constant. Basic training, that was a constant, you know. You obviously want to, you know, one-up everybody else. So, you know. But it takes, it takes, it takes time. It, again, it takes some people longer to get out, to get out of that mode than, than others. It took me about, like I said, it took me about two years before I just stopped doing the running and the push-up things, you know, just subconsciously, where I actually thought about it. I was like, you know what, I'm not doing that today. Right. So. <laughs> did, did you go back to school or did you go to work afterwards? Um, I was out, see, I was in reserve, so I had a, I had a job. Um, when, um, and I had graduated after I had um, finished my basic training and AIT and all that stuff. So um, I had a job. So I was I was al I was already working. But then um, when active duty came, your job is now military. So when you're done with that, sometimes you have your job back when you get out. Sometimes you don't. And when I got back, I didn't. So. That's one of the reasons I moved down here. Okay. Did you make any close friends while in the service? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Friends that. Uh, yeah. They. I still talk to a lot of them today. Yeah. And some they're all all over, all over the United States, all over the world. And oh yeah, you make some lifelong friends. Did you join any type of veteran uh, organizations or reserve organizations? Um, well, um, 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 yeah, I was with the American Legion uh, up in Michigan. Um, and I haven't joined one since I've been down here. I've been to a few, a few American Legion um, halls down here, but um, up in Michigan. Actually, I, I played softball for the American Legion and uh, all my reservist buddies and active duty buddies. Um, we played together and we played different um, other cities that had American Legions and, you know, some friends from those places also. So, okay. What did you go on to do as your career after you left the service? Um, well, <laughs> um, I used my degrees, I guess. Um, um, I have an accounting degree and an industrial management degree. And that was one again one of the reasons I moved down here and tried to get in the unit down here um, because a company hired me um, and moved me down here from Michigan. Um, the training, though, um, can't beat it. It makes you a well-rounded person, especially when you start doing other. Um, 
going to get other training and like the computer training like I said before and the administrator training things like that and then just the people skills that, that you get especially being in a leadership position in cadre um, where you can give direction and or take direction from you know unless you are the, super, <laughs> the head honcho you're going to be taking direction from someone and if you're this you know uh, 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 private that's all you're going to be doing is taking direction but then you start getting ranked then you start you can distribute direction also so it's a uh, it's it's a very good well to, very good at making you a well-rounded person if you take it as such could you explain the ranks from the highest to the bottom descending um, as far as enlisted or as, uh, it's enlisted, enlisted, um, command sergeant major, that is the top. He is basically just under whoever is in charge of the entire facility. So it could be a colonel, it could be, the, um, it could be, the, um, a general. The command sergeant major is the highest ranking enlisted person. So, yeah, he has still has to say yes sir, no sir to an officer, even if it's a first lieutenant or a second lieutenant. But they better be listening to him. He gives them the courtesy of calling them by their proper title, but they sure as heck better be listening to him because he knows he he is all knowing and all seeing. <laughs> uh, and then it just goes down, uh, Sergeant Major, um, um, oh my goodness, I'm missing a, I'm missing a Sergeant, uh, yeah, Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major, I'm missing a Sergeant in here, uh, I can't remember what it is, oh, First Sergeant, excuse me, First Sergeant, too. that was, okay, First Sergeant, then, um, then, uh, First sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant, uh, specialist, PFC, um, private, uh, second class, and then private. So I think, and I do. I know I've. I'm pretty sure I missed a sergeant between staff sergeant and first sergeant. I think. I just can't remember what the title is. Okay. Yeah. So slightly for, yeah, it's been a while. Right. right, right. <laughs> for someone who just enlisted and has just scary finished basic training and now into going to advanced individual yeah. training. What would they label or the title be? They still it 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 depends. If they hadn't received any rank, um, they and it depends also, active duty time, wartime reservists, things like that. Because the ranking system is, I can't say it's a little more slack, as you know, depending on active duty or uh, reserve duty. Um, it depends on how well you do. If you do the work, you put in the time and get. If you're just a total mess up all the time, it's gonna be a long time before you get out of the dungeon, so to speak. So. Um, if you come in as a uh, just a private, okay, high school education, nothing else, no college behind you or anything like that, which is another criteria as far as moving up in the rank also. Um, by the time you finish AIT, you may be um, uh, a private uh, any two, um, and then. Typically, you have to wait minimum a year and a half before you move up to the next rank. And then two or three years to move up to the next rank. Four or five years to move up to the next rank. So you just don't get it overnight just on your merit. You, you have to earn it. You have to put in the time. Time and grade. I hear that a lot. Time and grade. So years after service, did you attend any reunions? Oh yeah, I've um, I've visited my old um, reserve unit um, several times since uh, moving down here, and I've been down here s almost 17 years. So I've visited there um, a few times up in Michigan, 
I've um, see when you're out, it's, uh, especially um, active duty, it's hard to get back on to an active duty post because you don't have your credentials anymore. You don't have your military ID card or anything like that. So you have to ask special permission before you can just walk onto a post unless someone is allowing you in and you still have to go through the proper channels to get in it. Um, reserve um, battalion is a little different um, because typically you still know someone that's there and then they probably know someone that will vouch for you. Um, especially if you know, if you grew up in that group, in that unit, chances are there are probably five or six of them still left in there. And so you say, hey, I'm back in town. Can I, can I pop in for a bit? They're more than happy to see you. So, but you don't have, but see, reservists, that's on a smaller, again, a smaller scale. You probably, we had a hundred and some people, uh, well, actually a couple hundred people in my battalion, where, again, you go to Fort Benning or something like that, now you have 50,000 people. Big difference. <laughs> okay. Well, is there anything that you would like to add that we didn't cover in this interview? Um, no. Um, other than the fact that um, um, a lot of people have misconceptions about military service. I speak to a, a lot of parents all the time because I coach my kids in various sports. And uh, so you have parents that have kids of different ages and a lot of them say, well, what do you think about my child going to the service? What do you think about this? Um, sometimes they want to hear it, sometimes they really don't want to hear it. But I think military service is a very, very good place to get your child to, I, I, I don't know if I, conforming is the right terminology to use, but um, maybe get them acclimated to the potential of the real world, um, business, um, camaraderie, um, fellowship, things of that um, that nature, especially now, nowadays, because there's not as much home training as there was back when I was growing up. Um, so that actually could give them that, okay? So that um, help, I, th I think it helps society, myself. And it helps us stay free <laughs> yeah, free as a people, as a country. So, that's, I, I suggest it. My wife, wrong answer. But <laughs> it's kind of like my mother. <laughs> and my mother, after the fact, she thought it was a really good idea. And, you know, when my son's ready, if he wants to make his decision to do it, then I'll back him. So. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank um, you.